Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Je m'appelle Angela Cassie, directrice générale par intérim du Musée des Beaux-Arts du Canada. J'ai le grand plaisir de vous accueillir ce soir dans le magnifique Grand Hall Banque Scotia pour cet événement spécial à l'honneur de l'homme qui l'a conçu. I would welcome also those who are joining us this evening online as we celebrate and recognize uh, the architect uh, beyond the space. You may not feel it online, um, but it's a wonderful evening, clear. Uh, we can see the city of Ottawa sparkling around us, and I think it really captures a bit of uh, the vision for this place and space. And also for those of you online, uh, you can't see uh, the room full of people eager to hear this conversation, so welcome. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the gallery is situated on the unceded, unsurrendered traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather on these lands and for the knowledge keepers that guide and remind us of the importance, history, and significance of this place and space, and also of our individual and collective responsibilities. Their stewardship has sustained this land for thousands of years, and those stories, traditions, and culture have and will continue to shape the gallery's future for generations to come. I would like to uh, thank and acknowledge the board members of the National Gallery Foundation who are here. I would also like to recognize uh, the Honorable, the Très Honorable, Madame Michael Jean, former Governor General of Canada, Monsieur Lafont, thank you so much for joining us. Ambassadors, Deputy Ministers, welcome. Um, and I'd also like to uh, acknowledge some of my partners um, from the National Capital Commission uh, as we think about this place and space uh, and the communities that we're connected to. Uh, it's great to have leaders um, both in the community and on the national stage that recognize the importance and significance of this iconic place and space. This building opened in 1988. On its 30th anniversary, Moshe Safdi, who of course is its celebrated architect, wrote a piece for the gallery's magazine in which he talked about this particular room. He said, the Great Hall, overlooking Ottawa, the Ottawa River, overlooking Parliament, and the Canadian Museum of History has become a place for community. I really love that because today we are working hard to amplify this very idea. The National Gallery has placed its focus squarely on communities with the goal of using transformative art experiences to strengthen our connections with each other. And a lot of that inspiration in the new branding was actually inspired by this particular place and space. Uh, previously, it was about the facade of the building and that exterior outline. But when we were thinking about this idea of connecting and the idea of bringing in new voices to be part of the circle, all we had to do was look up. And it's actually the ceiling of this hall that helped inspire uh, the new logo. And I think it's that circle that we're working to develop and to welcome not only all of those in this room and who have had deep and long relationships with this gallery, but new voices, new audiences, new visitors, and new members. And we're really excited to be guided by this vision. And we really believe that it can only be together that we can be truly reflective and inclusive of the communities we serve. Si ces murs pouvaient parler, j'espère qu'ils rencontraient une histoire de constant renouveau, de vie nouvelle, de relations nouvelles et de changement. Change can be painful in a 142-year-old institution, and there have been a lot of changes here lately. But change must happen if we are to stay vibrant and relevant and continue pushing the envelope. So tonight, we celebrate Moshe Safdi and his new memoir, If, Walls, if the Walls Could Speak, My Life in Architecture. Uh, and I'm just showing you the book here because we're really excited that after the talk, he's also going to be available for book signing. So if you don't have one with you, we'll make that available to you with, through our boutique. Um, but really thankful that he's gonna take the time to do those signings as well. And he really encounts, recounts an extraordinary career and offers his vision for the role that architecture can play in society. Moshe conçoit l'architecture comme une force sociale au service du bien, qui peut renforcer la communauté et élever 
l'esprit humain. Nous fondons les mêmes histoires et les mêmes espoirs pour l'or qui est exposé dans ce musée. During a 60-year-old career as an architect, urban planner, educator, theorist, and author, Moshe has designed some of the world's most influential and memorable buildings. He is acclaimed as one of the greatest, most innovative architects of the past half century. And joining him today in conversation is Adele Weider, a highly respected, award-winning Canadian architectural writer, curator, and curatorial journalist whose work has been published in design journals, anthologies, and other publications across North America. So, I will ask you all now to join me in warmly welcoming Adele and Moshi to the stage. Ah, merci beaucoup. C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici dans ce bel édifice uh, avec ce grand architecte. Uh, uh, I'm just so honored to be here. This is one of my favorite buildings in Canada and elsewhere. And uh, I love this book. Uh, I learned a lot about architecture and a lot about you and uh, a lot about life and in, in so, in the way you think about things that, uh, that you make connections that I didn't think of before. Um, the format we're going to do, uh, because you may not be as familiar with uh, some of Moshe's work outside of uh, this city, is I um, thought I'd start out with, first of all, this is something, uh, I've done a lot of talks with architects and this is the first time where I've talked to the architect beforehand and he said, what are you interested in talking about? And, and I said, what? Wait, you're, you're a big, famous architect. You're supposed to say, this is what I'm interested in talking about. And uh, I think that was one of the powerful uh, things about the book and about uh, a lot of your work, uh, and the way you, you say you make it, is that you're making it for others. You're not making it for yourself. Um, and I did learn about uh, a lot of uh, international projects that uh, that you may not know about, that we're going to run what I sort of call his gri a bit glibly his greatest hits, uh, starting with uh, Canada and then Habitat and then going around the world. And we'll give you a flavor of what they're like. And we just have to get this thing going. Okay, something's happening. Yes. Okay, this is probably one that you, uh, you know, Habitat, 1967, that made you famous. Jerusalem, uh, the, now this was uh, the, the whole development, That's, right? Uh, in, in the 67, I am invited back to Israel for the first time after my arrival in Canada in 53. And I meet the mayor and, uh, of Jerusalem that had just been united, and I begin working on several projects in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And that's in the old city, uh, Yeshiva, a rabbinical college, in which the rabbis, uh, the clients, had mm -hmm. fired two architects. One did the very eclectic traditional building, and one was from New York. He did a glass box in the middle of the old city. And they asked me, uh, would you make for us a modern building or a traditional building? There was a threatening sound to the question. And I sort of thought rapidly and somehow it came to me as a Talmudic answer. If I succeed, you won't be able to answer the question. And that became kind of the motto for the work in Jerusalem and will develop that into, it developed into the whole question of context. And one of the next projects was this building after the work in Jerusalem. This is the Mamilla area in Jerusalem, which I completely rebuilt. It was the no man's land between the old and the new city. 
took 40 years to realize with a lot of opposition and objection, and today it's the heart of the city. We'll see. We'll hear more about this one only. later. <laughs> yeah, we'll hear a lot more about this later. Vancouver Library Square. So uh, just in context, uh, for 19 years I get no work at all in Canada uh, after Habitat. And it's very frustrating. There's a competition for the National Gallery, uh, the first one, on another site next to the Supreme Court. And I'm not included in the shortlist, and I get very upset about that. If I'm not one of 12 in Canada, what, what, you know, what's that all about? Uh, in 78, I go to t start teaching at Harvard, and I'm based in Boston. And then comes the Quebec Museum, the National Gallery, Vancouver Library, which you see here. And so a whole series of Canadian projects that were very exciting, cultural projects that one after the other. This is mid, uh, like 2000, uh, a series of cultural buildings that followed the period in which we were not doing housing at all. Seven, late 70s, 80s, well, several habitat commissions, none of them get realized, and I get involved with several cultural projects. The, this is in the United States. It's a science museum, exploration place in Wichita. It was my first project in the middle of the country. Um, and it was a breakthrough in the sense that in that project, I started building in relationship to the site. I actually created an island in the middle of the Arkansas River. And the whole geometry of the building is generated by the roof structure and all that, all generated by a geometry, a particular geometry. And then later in 2005, uh, the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, which emotionally was maybe the most difficult project I ever worked on. Uh, you, the project itself is set uh, on, a, on a hill, the Mount of Remembrance. The old historic museum was on top. And here was a question of how do you build a building three times the size. And I did not want to have a building on top of the hill, if you could go back one. Uh, and so I decided, does that do reverse? So yeah, uh, yeah. So I decided to cut the building through the mountain, to penetrate the mountain from one side and have all the galleries under the mountain and then, uh, and then burst out of the mountain towards the west to light and to the Jerusalem forest. And that's the point where you emerge from the galleries, which are very overwhelming in their content, obviously, and you come to that point where there's light and you see the forest and, and the, the, in a sense, the architecture tells you we prevailed, we, we're here. Amazing formwork as you get in these other prob uh, projects, and they, they all look different from one another. You don't have well. Much. This is part of this j began in Jerusalem. How do you get the building to belong? How do you get a building to be particular to the place, particular to the culture? And this was a particular challenge in that context. This was the National Museum of the Sikhs in the Punjab in India. The premier of uh, Punjab was visiting Israel on a state visit and was taken to Yad Vashem. He was emo very moved emotionally and asked to meet the architect. And he said to me, uh, we, the Sikh people, have suffered a great deal. We've been persecuted like the Jews. And, and we're going to build our national museum, and I'd like you to come and, and design it. And you know, we as architects, as you well know, go through competitions, interviews, there's no end to getting. And here he's asking me to come and do the National Museum, which became quite controversial, because what does a Canadian, Israeli, Jew know about the Sikh culture, and why did the 
Prime Minister, import an architect in the first place. And so the question is, could one do a building where the Sikhs really identify with the, with the architecture? And I spent a lot of time trying to understand the culture, the religion. And this is uh, what came out 10 years later um, in a, a holy town of Anandpur Sab outside Chandigarh building the building like the old fortifications out of the sand. And it's using local sandstone and stainless steel roofs. And I can tell you from talking to Sikh taxi drivers in New York that it's very much loved by the Sikh community. <laughs> Sometimes they, don't take, uh, they won't take a fare from me, so. <laughs> and now for something completely different. So this was a big shift in our practice and in my work because also related to Yad Vashem, uh, oddly enough, uh, the opening for Yad Vashem took place on a very cold night uh, and there were many heads of state, I think 70 heads of state, and there were speeches and went on. And then everybody rushed after the ceremony to the bathroom. And there was a big line, and I'm standing in line for the bathrooms, and someone comes next to me in a wheelchair, and it's Sheldon Adelson, the uh, chairman of Las Vegas Sands, um, and says to me, you did a pretty good job here. Uh, and then he says, you know, we are bidding for competing for an integrated resort in Singapore, and uh, I have a Las Vegas architect, but the Singaporeans are saying we don't want Vegas architecture. We want modern Singapore, the spirit of Singapore. Are you interested? And two weeks later, I was working on this project for which I had four weeks, four months to design and present because he'd already wasted six months on the other scheme. And, uh, and we just dived right into it, not having ever done a building of that type, and uh, we won the competition. But it's six million square feet. It was built and designed in four years, and it completely opened up Asia from, for our work and many other. And the Sky Park became something that we realized will apply to many, many projects. The idea that when you build high-density, high-rise buildings, the public realm can come to the upper level. Can, can be at different levels. It can span between buildings. It can connect between buildings. That the city can start being really three-dimensional. And that was the breakthrough in which we actually realized that for the first time. And more recently, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, which uh, is in Bentonville, Arkansas, a small Midwest town where Walmart was founded. And uh, Alice Walton, the daughter of the founder, has decided to, she, she has a major collection of art and decided to create a place for the community. And uh, it's really become completely transformative for that town. Uh, it's become the, the center of community life. Um, hotels are built around it because people are coming from around the country. And every time she bought a famous painting in a New York auction, there was a scandal that important paintings are being taken to the middle of the country and not staying in New York. It's all constructed out of Arkansas pine, wood, concrete wood and glass with copper roofs. And it is about discovering the place, uh, the decision to build in the valley, to dam the stream, to create bodies of water, uh, to cluster the museum into pavilions, so you experience nature and art very integrated. Now, this is what you call the, the entrance to Singapore, the, the airport. The jewel, mm -hmm. it's called, and it's in Singapore airport. It's a center to uh, connect all the terminals, and the question was they needed retail, airport space, uh, elaborate program, and an attraction. And there was a question what that attraction would be. Uh, our client team 
proposed dinosaurs and dinosaur park. Um, and I was wondering why would passengers go through Singapore to see dinosaurs and Singaporeans who come here, 70% of the traffic, um, I thought might come once, but why will they come back? You need something that's timeless, that attracts people of all generations, and we came up with the idea of a paradise garden, a mystical garden. And it is an amazing, uh, the roof of the structure is a concave toroidal dome, so when it rains, 18,000 gallons a minute come through this waterfall. When it doesn't rain, we pump the water that we collect. It transforms the air conditioning in the space. The plants are very happy, and the people are even happier. So, I mean, it's a new experience for airports. And some people actually detour to fly through Singapore rather than through another airport, because it's uh, become the most Instagrammable building in history. Is that a good thing? <laughs> no, that's, so the airport has become the destination. It is. And that's a project that followed Marina Bay. It's a 10 million square foot complex in the city of Chongqing, which is, uh, when I got the commission, I didn't know where Chongqing was. It's in the middle of China. I'm, I'm sure if I had hands, who has heard of Chongqing? A handful. It's the largest city in China, 38 million people. And at the tip where the city was founded, a little bit like the tip of, of Manhattan, we built a mixed-use complex. Uh, and again, there is this conservatory, which is a public space on the 50th floor. And um, when this was published, Sheldon Adelson, who had commissioned me to do Marina Bay Sands, called me and he says, uh, I don't like this, it's too much like my building. And I said, well, it's the same architect. And he says, still, I don't like it. I said, you want to be like Akbar the Great after building the Taj Mahal? He executed as architect. Uh, and almost that happened to me, because at that point he sued me. I, say, I tell the whole story in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the memoir. He sued me and actually tried to stop the client and us from building this. And there was an interesting discussion on, in the courts about is that an infringement of my own copyright and what does it mean? And the, the judge was convinced by two stories. If another architect had built this building, would I be able to sue him that he copied me? The answer was no. And the other question was, if Henry Moore did the sculpture that was reminiscent of his previous sculpture, would the owner be able to sue him for having done something which echoes the feeling of his other project? So we won. Now, one, one of my early questions I did want to ask you before we sort of dive into housing, which we could take three evenings just to go into, but it's one of the hot button issues, is, is the name of your, your book, because I think it is pertinent to every project you've talked about from Habitat onwards, but, uh, or at least it's very evocative to that. So how did your team come up to the, with the name, the title, If Walls uh, Could Speak? It, it was an agonizing process, actually. I, I, I had a title that I was quite locked into, which was Building a Life, a kind of in two different colors, Building a Life. And the publisher said, it's nice, but it's not going to sell the book. Um, and then they said, what about if walls could talk? And I said, that sounds like gossip. Um, and then they, said, they came back and they said, uh, what about if walls could speak? Well, that sounded a little more serious. But I got converted when the designer of the book, uh, Michael Gericke of Pentagram, t uh, came up with this picture that he had taken in Singapore, where I'm looking in between two partitions of a wall. 
and put it together with a title, and I said, sold. So it's not my title, but I like it. And I did uh, choose, since you gave me the choice, to have a few images uh, for this uh, conversation of, uh, that are in the book, but that you didn't design, of, uh, because before housing, uh, before Habitat, you're faced with these, as a McGill student, you know, you're looking at the polarization of housing, these micro-apartments or single-family housing, uh, this is Levittown that you have in the book, um, tract housing, and these were the two choices, and they still, to, to this day, seem to be the two choices in, in housing, you know, almost 60 years after Habitat. This is the thesis uh, sketches you have in your book of the early Habitat. Um, That's my extra McGill thesis, graduation thesis. Yeah, from Regal. That would have been, what, 65 or something? 61. 61, yes. And uh, as built, um, it was much less uh, large, much less ambition. But what was fascinating, both in the unbuilt and the built version, is that this was housing that harnessed the imagination. And I don't think we see a lot of imagination in housing types these days. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that about what that, uh, was that what you set out to accomplish with Habitat? Because there's a lot of misunderstandings as I discovered in my own research about what Habitat was supposed to be and what housing is supposed to be. It, it, it evolved and I think it's kind of important to, to sort of go through the steps because uh, while I was a student at McGill in the 60s, uh, people didn't do housing for their thesis. They did opera houses and, and museums. And, and the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation, for those who remember uh, uh, the Federal Housing Agency, uh, invented a new scholarship program. One student from every school of architecture in Canada would travel through the continent to study housing, and I jumped on the occasion and applied and got included. And five of us uh, traveled um, extensively, um, and we went through suburb after suburb, and we went to Chicago and to New York and saw these massive public housing. And even the luxury housing didn't seem to be fundamentally different typologies, the same typology, basically. And I came back with a kind of conclusion that we had to reinvent the apartment building, because people who could afford went to the suburbs, because they wanted a house with a garden, with their privacy, and put up with commuting and, and all the inefficiencies of it. And that led to my deciding to do, for my thesis, a housing system, I called it, which is what we showed earlier. Prefabricated units that are stacked in such a way that there are gardens for every unit, streets instead of corridors. And that led, anyhow, at that point, pause, I went to Philadelphia and worked for Kahn. And a year later, my professor, Sandy Van Ginkel shows up in Philadelphia and says, we're going to have a World's Affair in Montreal, and I've been put in charge of uh, the master plan, and I'd like you to come and head the team uh, that designs the master plan for Expo. And, and with the kind of nerve that I had as a young person, I was then 25, I said, I'll accept the job on one condition, that I will be able to, to develop my thesis further to propose it as a major pavilion for the World's Fair. And Sandy said, uh, well, you've, if, you, if, you, if you want to do it in your spare time after doing the master plan, you're welcome. But um, this was an amazing opportunity because during the day we designed the master plan and at night started developing what became Habitat. And, uh, got funds and got support, and Expo Management really started supporting our efforts, and um, proposed 
this is not, this is the building that was built. But if you go, this is the original proposal of 1,200 units on Cité du Havre with schools and offices and uh, shopping, like a, 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 a full community. And I remember vividly the day that uh, Expo Management approved it in principle, but subject to government decision. We all came to Ottawa and met with the cabinet, chaired by Lester Pearson, and the whole discussion. And at the end of that was, we're not going to do the 42 million. We're not going to do tax concessions. There's two dangerous precedents. And there's no time to do it. But there's $15 million. Do what you can do. And my first reaction was, uh, everything or nothing. But I came to my senses. <laughs> And um, we realized that $5 million would be required for the factory, and we ended up building 160 units, housing units, which is the habitat that I'm working on in this photograph, and the habitat that was realized. There's the factory with the units being prefabricated, bathrooms, kitchens being placed into them, windows all installed and then assembled. So. Whereas Habitat had extraordinary impact, in fact, it was a part of the idea. It was not a whole integrated community, and, but it still had extraordinary impact as we know today. And do you think, it, it seems like nothing like that could happen today, even, at, uh, even though you did it at a modified scale. It, it's, it's a fair, to me, looking back, Civil servants, the head of the Corps of Engineers, Ed Churchill, Robert Shaw in the Expo Management, 25-year-old recent graduate, new immigrant who never built a building in his life, proposing something of that complexity and backing it up um, and supporting it, and then the government decided to go with it. I'm not sure that would happen today. Would it happen today? I don't know. It's, it, it's an amazing vote of confidence in two things, I think. The spirit of the country, the optimism that we had on our centennial. It was real excitement about the, the, what's, what, what's, what's to come. And also support of, of, of young people, of, of youth, of, of, of new ideas. And, and you've designed other uh, pilot projects, other versions of Habitat, which, have, which two, I think, are realized? Well, what happened, what happened then is, uh, you know, it felt like you're top of the mountain, you could do anything, and we started getting many commissions for more Habitats. New York, Puerto Rico, Israel, uh, Tehran, and one after the other, they didn't get built, or they began to get constructed but aborted, and one realized that outside the context of a World's Fair, economics, unions, technology, uh, industry was, was going to be tough to do something so radical again. It's at that point that this is Puerto Rico habitat. It's at that point that really the thrust of my work in housing diminished. I got involved in Jerusalem. I came back and did the cultural buildings in Canada. It wasn't until about 2009 that we came back full steam, which I think you have here. Oh, that's an interesting side story, which is one of the few things we were involved with in Canada before 78 was what was then called Frobisher Bay, uh, housing for the Inuit community, which were then being moving into what was then called the matchboxes. And we came up with this prefabricated fiberglass and plywood uh, residences that clustered into villages. And just as we were ready to start building, the Northwest Territory government decided that this was raising the bar too high. What? But what I wanted to show is that in 19... 2009, we set up in the office a research fellowship. And we said, let's go back and rethink habitat, higher densities, 10 times higher, 30 times higher, mixed use, 
has technology changed? And one of the systems we developed, this is New York, diagrammed, and reimagined the same density as center Manhattan. Next. These are all the models of our studies of that research fellowship. And next. And that was one of the systems we developed, which was of a density, I think, 30 times of the original habitat with offices and, and other mixed uses. And we showed in the same density of Man Manhattan this complex of, with gardens, a lot of public garden spaces uh, at many levels of the building. And that theoretical project spun off real projects. Next. This is in Chiguadao, China. Uh, a whole complex on the seafront, which is middle income housing, which we completed recently. Housing in Quito, in Singapore, in Colombo, all with the ideas of habitat. And I guess I would add that at this point, it's clear that the next generation of architects that followed us, like uh, in their 50s, uh, like uh, Bjorke Ingels and Big, or Herzog de Moron, or some of the Dutch uh, f uh, uh, teams have really embraced habitat now as a main thrust of their work, as a, con as a concept. And students are back looking at habitat, so that full cycle now, it's become the center point of what's happening in housing. And yet, uh, you mentioned middle income housing, even with Bjorke Ingels, it's, it's, it's still, uh, primarily focused on luxury housing, that upper income uh, bracket. And where I feel is this great gap is something so fundamental as housing. There's, there's nothing more fundamental in architecture than the shelter, the places we live, and it's where we have the greatest paucity of imagination amongst architects. I mean, to be fair, it's the problem transcends architecture. It does. The problem is, uh, first of all, the price of land. I mean, you know, we work very hard to reduce the cost of construction by 10%, but the land goes triple. Um, and why are land values what they are? Even in countries where land is controlled publicly, um, is a complex question, which is basically greed, bottom line. Um, the densities we built, Toronto, I'm just coming from Toronto this morning, ridiculous density, it's too high. The densities of downtown Toronto are very extreme, and what we're forgetting is that medium density gives an answer for, low, for lower cost housing, which is, could be very effective, so instead of the extremes of suburbs and extreme high density, we should have also some medium density, five, six, seven stories, which is some of the projects we're working on now doing wood modules, wood modular units. Yeah, that's partly, I think, uh, the collective uh, of the people, the, the voters uh, often vote against uh, uh, high density projects in their neighborhoods and, and then you, you have this polarization of all or nothing as you spoke. Uh, of the low density suburbs and the too high density inner cities. Uh, why are we collectively so reluctant to embrace a middle density? Or is it even a public thing? Is it again the developer driven uh, economics? I think we, we are coming out of an era for the last 25, 30 years where planning was discredited. The idea that you do affirmative zoning that is designed to achieve certain densities in certain areas of the city and other densities at other areas, something that Singapore does all the time, that many European countries do as a matter of course, uh, we have been reluctant to do. Our planning departments are very weak. They have no, and it's basically a developer's driven urban design. And you can see city after city, the pattern where land ownership by the developer drives the density and with it the prices. I mean, if you zone land to be a lower density, 
it'll be cheaper per unit automatically. But there's a reluctance to do serious planning. And I think it's, it's, the, it's the emphasis of the market knows best. Well, in city planning, the market does not know best. Should we move on to a happier subject? No. <laughs> I think uh, everyone in this room would love to hear more of your stories, and you do have uh, a lot of them in the book, about this building that we're sitting in now. Well, this building was totally transformative for me because it was, after Habitat, the first major public institution, the first museum. And it, there was a wonderful team of people headed by Gene Sutherland Boggs, who, as I recall in the memoir, is one of the greatest clients I ever had. She knew museums, she knew what worked in museums, but she was also open-minded open -minded to explore new ideas about what a museum might be. I, this, this sketch, uh, we, we developed a number of alternatives. Actually, I should backtrack. The competition for the, for the museums was done in a way that 12 architects in Canada were short-listed, and six designed the museum across the river, and six designed this building. And we were asked which one you prefer to do. And I figured I live in Quebec, and the other museum is in Quebec. Maybe that gives me a better chance, and I was interested in the idea of the Museum of Civilization. So I did the design for Hull. And then it was decided that Cardinal would do that, but they liked what I did in Hull, and so I would work on the National Gallery. So we did a number of alternative schemes, and then one scheme emerged which had the entrance by Sussex and the great ramp coming up to the Great Hall, which is at the point where you see the river and parliament. And that decision to ramp up was made when we built here, in this location, a wood tower, and we climbed up, up to this level, and we saw that that's where you needed to be to see the river, parliament, and the other museum. So, going back, sorry, you're rushing on me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, going back, at some point, I developed two alternatives. Can you go back to the first sketches? In one case, we called it the extrovert scheme. You, it is the building that we actually built, where you come in, you come up, and you see the city, and the great hall, and the whole building is exposed transparently to the city. And then you start entering the galleries. In the other alternative, which is uh, on your right, you came in on Sussex, and the ramp came up, but there were galleries on both sides of the ramp, so that there would be a wall, a solid wall towards the city, and you were in, embraced by art galleries on both sides. And that I nicknamed the introvert scheme. And there was the committee with the curators and and the curators were pretty well for the introvert scheme because you come in and you're immediately surrounded by art. You don't get distracted by the view. And Gene uh, Boggs realized that this was a big moment of decision. And she said, you know, the cabinet asked to see alternatives. Let's go show them the alternatives. And so these two schemes made in model form were taken up the hill um, to a cabinet meeting. Uh, this time it was not Pearson, it was Pierre Trudeau chairing the meeting. And uh, there was a fascinating discussion uh, in which uh, the Minister of Finance said, uh, is there a price difference between the two? And I said, I think the extrovert scheme is probably 10, 15, 20% more. And after a few minutes, he said, I think the introvert scheme is Canadian. We're modest people. <laughs> and I support the introvert scheme. And the Minister of Culture, to whom we actually reported, uh, was for the 
And then uh, the Prime Minister comes behind me and says, Moshe, which scheme do you want? And I said, you know, I'm ambivalent. You know how it is if, when you're in love with two women? And he says, yes, I understand. <laughs> Literally what happened. And then he cast the, 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 the vote. He said, the museum of the future is open, is inviting. We should go with the extrovert scheme. The city should see the building, and the building should see the city. And, and it was amazing to me. I was passive, truly passive in that maybe most important decision for this building. On the left. Now, Jean Boggs had her, her doubts about the ramp because she said, we're an aging community, and what is it going to be like climbing up these 80 meters at 5% slope, which all of you have done tonight. I see most of you at least have done tonight. And she said, you better find me a precedent. And we started looking in the literature, and we found one, the scamp, the ramp in the front of the Scala Regia in the Vatican. And off we went, the whole building committee and the architects and a few people to Rome. And for an hour, Gene Boggs and all of us went up and down the ramp. And that's when it got approved. Um, another moment was uh, the, the program required to have daylight in the galleries. And this is a two-story building. So how do you get daylight into the lower galleries? If you do it through windows, it's really damaging, and it doesn't provide the appropriate light for, for a gallery. And so that's when we had the idea, which you see in the model that we made, of having shafts penetrate the upper floor lined with mirror. And that carries the light all the way down. And it worked beautifully in the model. But if you go back, but no, no, one, yeah, but nobody believed that what worked in the model would work in real life, and it was too big a risk. So we were told to build a mock up, a life size mock up, which this is somewhere in the suburbs of Ottawa. I don't remember which direction. It looked like somebody was building a church. And inside, you actually were able to see the real light coming in. And that's when the idea was approved. And the only thing I would say is I hope the skylights would be slightly more open than they are these days, which you see here, like the kind of light that you get at both levels of the building. The Great Hall, by the way, was not in the initial program. It was called the foyer. And increasingly, as we discuss the building, we realize that this is the nation's capital. And this room should be a room that can really handle community events of all kinds and events of heads of state. And the whole arrangement of security to have events of state was then worked out for this building when it became nicknamed the Great Hall. Now, uh, we have to wrap up now, but that leads me to a good final question. Uh, you talk in your book a lot about spirituality, uh, particularly in the cultural buildings, the religious buildings, and in your work in Jerusalem. Um, can you be specific? Uh, on the National Gallery, did you bring or inform it with a sense of spirituality, a, a building for art? I think, I think, what we do as architects is first we have to solve the problems of what the building, how the building functions, how it works, what the program was for it. But there is that extra component of uplifting the spirit. And I think that's true of, of doing a museum. I think it's true when you do a hospital. If you can just make people in a hospital feel that their spirits are uplifted, that there's light, that there's nature, um, then, then it becomes a place of healing. But that is, uh, so that component of, of spirituality, I think, is very central to my work. And it's, it's elusive. Um, 
One of the experiences I had in this building, which was one of the most exciting moments for me as an architect, is just the week of the opening, we're coming up the ramp. I was with my wife, Michal, and we came into the middle of this room, and there was a, a, a lady with her six-year-old son, six, seven-year-old son, walking next to us, and he looked up. The sun was coming in through the, the sails, and he said, Mama, does God live up there? Yes. And that was like, you know. And would you be so, you said that in Toronto, you, um, you closed the talk by reading this poem, which is such a beautiful poem that you've uh, ended your book with. Could you do that again for us? This goes back to 1980, where there was an enormous discussion in architecture, postmodernism versus modernism, uh, social responsibility versus architecture is, if, is an expressive art. And at, in 1980, I wrote this poem to summarizing a book I wrote, Form and Purpose. And it goes, he who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks order shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself the servant of his fellow beings shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through nature, the nature of the universe, and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. If we seek truth, we shall find beauty. Thank you so much. You don't have questions? So I don't know about you, but I think the time just flew, uh, and we actually had an extra five minutes, ten minutes that we let them um, speak. But I, I think, I think we can hear a little bit more. Is everyone okay? I, I feel, yeah, a little bit more. <laughs> Adele, can I call you back up? <laughs> I think, um, you know. That, that poem was so beautiful, um, and I think we were also thinking about taking some questions from the audience, but I know that, Adele, you, you've just guided us so beautifully in this conversation, and so I'm sure there were some more questions that you had heard um, as you've been preparing this that you'd like to ask, so could I ask you to um, continue to guide us in this conversation? Oh, it's, it's such a hard act to follow after that poem, but uh, I think uh, we can just go maybe to the primordial qualities of architecture, which are often forgotten in these, uh, this developer-driven lives we lead. But let's go back to the Vitruvian triad, you know, beauty, uh, utility, uh, uh, firmness, commodity, venustus. Do you, it, is that something that you keep in your mind as an architect? In, in some ways, this question is why I wrote this book. I mean, when I wrote the book, first of all, I, I, say, I was determined there should not be a book that's focusing on architects, but on the public at large. And so as you write, you imagine you're talking to someone, and I locked in on a friend of mine who's not an architect, and he became my, not literally, but figure, uh, sort of metaphorically, who I was talking to. And the reason is that, that through my life as an architect, so often I talk to lay people who are not in the profession, and they're mystified. They're mystified about what we do, how we do. They feel they don't have the tools to really judge architecture. I mean, the, the way it goes is, I know nothing about architecture, but. And then, and then you get the buts. But essentially, I feel that, um, I hope this book will help people be able to walk into a building and not just look outside a building, but walk into a building and, and think, what does it do well? What does it not do well? Has it served its purpose in a profound sense? Not, 
And also the, the word function becomes so misused. I mean, how often have you heard, because I hear it all the time, this building is not functional. It's beautiful, but it's just not functional. Well, it's not possible if the building is not functional, and by function I mean what the purpose of the building is meant to be, not just if the plumbing works, which is clearly functional, but uh, you know, if it's a school, is it a good place for learning? Is it inspiring for the students and for the, uh, and for the teachers to be there together? Is it a place that, that encourages the interaction between these kinds of questions? It's not possible for the building to be not functional and beautiful. It, 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 if you have an opera house where the acoustics are terrible, it cannot, it's not beautiful, even if it's a pretty shape from the outside. And so that kind of more profound way of looking at architecture is what I'm hoping to explain and achieve because um, another way of looking at it is people look at a building and immediately judge like or not like from in a formal, in a formal way. The best way to judge a building is to look at it 20 years after it's built, 20, 30 years after it's built. How does it, how has it served its purpose? How has it weathered? How has it met the forces of life? You, and you can tell right away, 20 years later, whether it, whether it has or hasn't. Mm -hmm. Like in this building, as you're doing now, as we're all doing, but we don't have that as a business model. Like we always just talk about the new buildings. Uh, that's cool. one problem. But I'd, what about uh, for future, you know, you were so young when you got your big breakthrough to do something really imaginative. Uh, and a lot of uh, young architects I talk to now, they say that the systems change. They have to work for a big name firm and uh, the, the, usually with a much older principal and they're kind of anonymous, and they don't have the opportunities that a young architect used to do. And, and I think youth is, is one of the times in our lives where we can just uh, have that great burst of imaginative thinking that, that tends to temper you know, as we get older. What is your message to uh, the next generations of architecture that, that feel confined in their imagination? You know, architecture is kind of at a very, uh, in a ter at a turning point. So when I, often when I'm asked the question, I'm, I'm wondering, should I share with them all my concerns? Uh, what's happening in architecture is that where we had most offices, 20 people, 30 people offices, now they are the mega offices, and they swallow up all the architectural firms around them. So there's this, like this ACOM, which is now 20,000 people, and they keep, every week they swallow another architectural firm, they buy them. And for a young architect, you get into this network of, I don't know what to call it exactly, and the, uh, not only do they get lost, but the opportunities for mentoring, for learning, and all that are, are, are not there. And so this is a trend which I hope would reverse, but it's part of a much bigger economic, uh, these conglomerates in every field seem to also affect architecture. But for a young architect, I would say get a job in a good office that's small, if you can, and learn at the beginning by doing every phase of the work and don't go into it unless you're really passionate because you're going to be underpaid and work longer hours than any other profession that I know. But if you persist, the rewards can be amazing. And, and for us, the public, like a lot of uh, public institutions uh, across Canada and elsewhere in the world, they're, they're lacking the... Um, the funding, the, the, the capital funding to get built, to, to expand, and to maintain themselves. What, is there a message for us, the broader public, that we should be hearing? I, I don't know if that's a planted question, but this building urgently needs maintenance money. Urgently needs <laughs> maintenance. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this building is 30 years old, and, and, and it needs a lot of tender love and care.
I, I think it's uh, it's very complex. Uh, you know, the the kind of maintenance that buildings of this stature need, and I'm not sure that uh, voters, public, uh, the public are aware of it. It's so I guess it's uh, there's a communication uh, job to be done too. But uh, yes, we need uh, we need those that support that wide public support. We need to tell our elected leaders that we support the maintenance and the growth of this building and others. So I really hope that does happen. Well, I think on that note, it was not a planted question by me, but thank you, Adele. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that additional question. Thank you for being put on the spot a bit. Um, can we please warmly thank Adele and Moshi for this conversation? Alors, merci à tous et à toutes pour euh, votre attention et pour les minutes supplémentaires qu'on a pu prendre pour cette discussion. Uh, we're really excited to move now to an opportunity for those of you who um, want to have a book signing. I, I was told you signed books for over half an hour in Toronto, so we'll see how we do here today. Um, but I think what I really appreciated about what you shared is um, that element about open and dimensional. Um, and I think that the foresight that you had when you were building this building, here we are 30 odd years ago, and as we've been looking at rebranding, we've talked about the principles of open and dimensional. So at times we see it as innovation, but I think we're actually growing into the vision that you set out for us. So thank you very much for reminding me of that um, and reminding the role that arch art and architecture can have to uplift, provoke, uh, soothe, entertain, and inspire us. So thank you very much for that. Um, and so uh, I think when we're talking about that and talking about that responsibility um, and also the, the, the maintenance um, and the development of this building, I think you've uh, offered us um, some pathways and also um, some, um, some important challenges. So uh, I think that what we're going to do now is move to the book signing. Uh, for those of you who um, want that opportunity, uh, I'm going to just point to the visitor services desk over there and um, that's where we're going to have uh, the lineup um, and then he'll be signing uh, books at the back of the room uh, which is over there so you need to start over here to get the book and then the signing will, will be over there. Um, so what I'm just going to ask um, is just um, would you please stand so we can acknowledge you one more time. Thank you for your contributions to architecture not only here in Canada and the world. So as he heads to the back, I would just like to thank the entire team at Safety Architects for their collaboration on the event and all of the gallery staff. Merci, bonsoir, miigwech. <laughs>